Hello and welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. I'm going to talk a little today about why we use the notation system we do and how we go about solving. Just because we do occasionally get um, emails or comments on the videos asking why we don't solve puzzles in the same way that the commenter does. And what's quite interesting to me about those is that People have clearly got used to solving Sudoku their way sometimes, and once they've decided what their way is, often they assume that that's how everybody solves Sudoku. So, um, one of those, for example, um, is a fairly classic. Somebody wrote to us recently to say they were a bit interested in Sudoku when they first came across it, but they soon got really bored entering all the possibilities for cells. And I think what that means is they were putting in all the candidates. So for instance, in this cell, you'd go, well, it could be any of those. And here could be any of those. And here um, could be those. And here the same one. So you'd end up with that in the box and you could go around doing this for the whole puzzle. And it would throw up some um, solvable cells. Indeed, in some ways, it's how most machine solvers work, because they have the kind of computing power to do that very quickly. But for us, this seems like a very inefficient method of solving Sudoku. Yes, you can reduce it to all the possibilities in every cell and then spot the easy eliminations and then hope to spot further doubles and triples and make the normal progress, but it strikes us as an extremely slow way of doing things. And um, it's not a method we favour, not just because we like speed, but because we don't really think it helps people understand the puzzle and it is slow and it's a very cumbersome technique. It's just not very useful. Um, another way that uh, people often comment, and you'll be aware if you follow our comments that there's one person in particular who's very keen to always show solvers a notation-free method. He doesn't like these small numbers that we put in at all. He thinks that that sort of technique known as pencil marks is not what pure Sudoku is about, and that Sudoku puzzle should be solved just by working out definite certain numbers that must go in and putting them in once those have been found. And as I say, he likes to provide um, a kind of guide to how to do that for lots of the puzzles we publish. And I mean, thanks, I guess, from anybody who does like seeing that. But again, I don't think it's particularly helpful. I don't think it really um, advances the understanding uh, I do remember that somebody once proposed, having specialised in this technique, that they should uh, get a chance to go up against the time Sudoku champion in a no-pencil-mark version of Sudoku. Well, that seemed very artificial to me. Lots of people make pencil marks on the puzzle. Everybody does it at the World Championships. It's not abnormal, and we don't recommend it. Um, a third technique that rather surprised me, somebody wrote to us recently and said, why don't you do it like normal people do and work on the ones first and then the twos and then the threes and then the fours and then the fives and see where you get. And that struck me as not likely to be what normal people do or what is normally done. But you can see that you could make some progress. You look at these two ones and you've got one in one of those two cells but then you compare this one with that one, you're not getting very far with the ones. <clears throat> and I don't know whether this guy's technique would then sort of give up a bit with the ones and move on to twos. Um, like with the twos here and here, you could narrow down to quite succinctly there to just those two cells down here, it would be in those. Still not really giving anything. And I think it's probably not until you get up to eights or something that you would really make much progress in this sort of puzzle. So, again, 
I don't think that technique can be extrapolated out from one solver to what everybody does. It's really not what people do. So instead, to reiterate what we do like to do, and in fact, the same as that suggested start for the uh, for the ones method, is to use Snyder notation, which was named because uh, Dr. Thomas Snyder, who's won the World Sudoku Championship multiple times and is really one of the renowned experts in the field. I don't think he was necessarily the first person to come up with this method, but he certainly publicized it and talked about it. And what we do is we look for instances where we can, tell, we can narrow down the possibilities of a certain digit within a certain box of the Sudoku. So here in this right-hand side box, where can one go? Well, given this one, this one, and this one, there are only two possibilities. And once you reduce the possibilities for any given digit in a box to two or three places, that can become quite powerful. So we then spend our time kind of scanning for other possibilities where we can reduce the numbers in a box to just two or three positions. I think Simon prefers it to always be two, but I think it sometimes helps for it to be three. And that's the method we use. Um, we try and not mix it for regular puzzles with the version of um, all candidates. So you suddenly notice a cell where only two digits can go. Um, and you kind of want to note that down. Like in this cell, for instance, here, this has to be either a one or a two. But if we put in a one or a two, that's conflicting with the normal method. Normally, if we were marking ones in the box, they'd have to go in all those three cells and two in those two. So we try and keep it fairly regular and just do Snyder notation so that we understand what we're looking for. Otherwise, you kind of have to balance in your head which bits of notation were one sort and which were another. We do have the corner notation available for people who want to do that in the software. So um, for that, you could kind of suddenly note down, oh, sorry, in, in this cell, very experienced at using our own software, but that's how it goes. <laughs> really not. <laughs> Hopeless. Right, so here you could put one, four, and seven in the corners, um, but and, and know then that you are noting the only possibles. But that's not what we do. So that's what we do. And then after that, our technique is really just based on scanning for possible useful areas of the grid to work on and finding numbers that might prove useful as we go along. So five is limited in column four into the top box there. Nine must be in one of those two cells. And we kind of think that in a normal puzzle, this method will bear fruit. And you just keep then scanning the puzzle to try and find ways forward from uh, the information that you've got so far. Now, one of the techniques that I think both of us have developed is a very quick kind of cycling through all the possible numbers to work out what are missing from cells. So we would hope to spot these kind of naked singles as they crop up. Um, nine up here must be one of those two, for instance, because of that nine. But that's kind of an added on task that comes from experience and obviously that's what we're hoping to bring you is is the benefit of our experience in solving puzzles so this puzzle that i've got loaded up here is a new york times hard puzzle and we'll just see how our technique does obviously you can have a go at the puzzle yourself we've got the um we've got it loaded into our software in the description and do please have a go at it I'm going to talk through an attempted solve for the puzzle and we'll see how that goes. And it would be interesting to know how your experience um, either accords or differs with my own. So I've already obviously in, in that part of the video noted down some of the um, restrictions that I've been noticing so far. I'll try and concentrate a bit more and pick up some of the others that where we could make some headway at this point. Um, 
And as I say that, I'm looking for them and not really finding things. So down here in this box, we've already got four, five, seven as givens. One, two, six, nine, we've made an effort at. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Oh, no, I didn't. Yes, I did finish off the twos. So this cell here, I know that three and eight are the only two um, digits that I haven't tested in this box. And yet I can see they both point to this cell, which has only got one other possible candidate. So that's kind of telling me that that is a naked single. And as you can see from the row, we've got nine, eight, five, and three, from the column, two and six, and from the box, four and seven. And that only leaves one as a possibility there. So in goes the one, and it comes out of those two cells. And this one, Again, three and eight are pointing to this. This now becomes a naked single, and that's a two. So two is in one of those cells in the top box, and one in one of those. It really helps. A very standard technique, again, is to, as soon as you establish something using one axis, as it were, so I'm looking at this horizontal row, and I've got the one and the two, then immediately see if they help you in the vertical. So one and one gives me a one in one of those two. Two and two gives me a two in one of those two. But then we come back and concentrate on the row again. This one can't be a six. So six is now limited to those two cells. And it must be there in that box. Um, four could be there or there. But Snyder notation doesn't allow me to fill those in as possible fours. That's not what it's about. So I'm not going to do that. Um, let's see what else we can do. Seven, two, four, six, five, one, eight, two, five. So two now is actually placed here. From this two and this two and this two, the only cell left in this box that can house a two is that one. That's fixed the seven and that's fixed the six. And now we can finish off the row with a four. So that was a useful start there. Uh, it's always nice to finish something off. We can also put in a four here because of that four and that four. These two last cells are five, eight in some order, and I don't know what that order is yet. But now we can look at the end column, nine, six, one, seven, eight, two and four are both in the top box already. So these two cells can't be five and six after all. They must be two and four in some order. And that means five and three are in the pair of cells above there. Um, and that means these two cells here are nine and six. We can tell what order because of that six. So we can put in the nine and six there. And again, that's a useful um, marker of what we can do. So then seven now is interacting quite nicely. Those two cells working on this box are ruling out all of these cells as possible. So seven must be in one of those two. There must be a seven along here somewhere. Um, six, eight, five, two, six, two, seven. Right, one, nine must be somewhere down there. We've got seven, two, four, one, five, six, nine. But uh, three must be up there somewhere. But eight, annoyingly, could be in several of the cells in that box. So although I've filled in all the possibles now, it's not all that helpful. Ah, but what is worth noticing is the collocation of fours. Now we've got four must limited to rows four and five there and four limited to rows four and five there. That means that we get two fours in row four and five. These cells can't contain a four. So the four must be in one of those two cells and because of this four we know where it is. That's there. That gives us a four up here and a little bit more progress has been made. Um, Let's see where else that can lead us, in fact. So I think those two pairs of fours are the only fours we have left to fill in, but we can't determine where they are yet. Four, six, five. So I'm looking for something else that will help us move forward. Um, 
can't help feeling this row could be useful here with five digits already placed, but I can't necessarily make any further progress on that row at the moment. I don't know, again, that's kind of just instinct that it feels like something might break there. Nine is limited to those ones. And again, it's eight and three that we haven't been able to place in this box, but they're not very helpful, I don't think. So five and three in there. Ah, one here, I should have spotted this a while ago. Again, it may not be all that helpful, but it's always worth noting when a number gets limited to two cells in a box. Seven must be up here. Hmm, that's not necessarily something we can advance from either. And so it's getting a little bit harder now to see what we can do to make progress. Two is there or there? So I'm still just looking for something to break through on, but this is a hard puzzle. It's not necessarily going to come easy to uh, spot another move. I can get rid of that two there at least. This can't be seven or five. Five in row two must be in one of those two cells. That's not a five, seven pair because seven's possible there. Um, so although that might be five and seven, seven could be there. Ah, okay, this is very interesting in this puzzle. Now look, here in this row, and I mean this is, I don't know how to kind of describe the technique for spotting this, I just have spotted it. So, in fact, let's add the nine as well. So this row and this column both have 64298 fully marked now in row two and column two. What does that mean for box one? It means that for these four cells, they can only contain one, three, five, and seven. They must be what you could call a hidden quadruple of one, three, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Right, sorry, um, one and three. So that's a hidden quadruple of one, three, five, and seven. And that rules those four digits out from these corner cells, which must now be two, eight, and six. And that's quite a useful, I would hope, step forward. It's very rare that you spot something like this and it's not worth anything. So that one can't be a six because there's already a six in the row. So we've got two, eight, and six in these three cells. That is, no, I was going to say that gets rid of this too, but it doesn't. How's that going to help us? I'm sure it should help us. It's very annoying when you come up with what looks like a decent spot of that one, three, five, four, seven quadruple, and you can't quite see how that does then enable you to break forward. Um, well, let's be aware of it anyway, as we continue looking for other moves. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, one, that one means this one isn't a one. Um, it could still be... No, I worked out earlier, it can't be five and seven because this cell can't be five or seven. They have to be in that pair. So this is now a three. So we can get rid of the threes from that set. Um, and that, though one of those being a one, means we can place the one here as well. This one is now a one. It's the only possibility given what's in its column and row. Um, that gets rid of the one possibility there. 
that places the one in this box. It's the only place a one can now go. Um, given that this is a 2-4 pair, we've restricted the 5 now to just this cell. And that places the 5 and 8 down here. That fixes the last bits of this box. Now I think we're making some real progress. And that 9 can go in there. That fixes the 9 down here. And eight now goes in there, six here, three here. Uh, these are one and five, and there's a five in column three already, so we can tell which way round they are. Seven must go here, and these two are a three, six pair. We get a five up here, but we don't know about that one, seven pair, but we do know three goes here. We could work that out a while ago. And this has all stemmed from that quadruple. It was actually the quadruple itself rather than the other corner squares that turned out to be more useful. Now, nine, one, seven, four, three, six, nine. These nines have been resolved by this nine. And I think the last nine in the grid also goes in there now. This one can't be a five, so that pushes five down to there. And this box can now be completely filled, thanks to this eight and this seven. And now we can complete these two columns. This pair is a four, seven pair. This seven, one pair has been resolved by the one that came in down at the bottom. This can't be a six, that's not helpful. Wow, well, even at this stage, I can't quite see what not what to do next. One of those is seven, one of those is three, and two could be in any of them as far as I can see. So what am I missing? I'm clearly missing something at this point. There must be some fairly, oh yes, look, the top row, we've had an eight there. There's <laughs> only one possibility left. That resolves the rest of that box. That fixes these. And we're just resolving the last few pairs now. So quite a tricky New York Times puzzle. Um, that's how I'm using Snyder notation and our general scanning techniques to try and find something to solve it. There was, as we saw, one sort of useful trick was spotting that 1, 3, 5, and 7 were limited up there, and that was because the same five digits in both row and column were pointing at this box and all, therefore, concentrating their power, as it were, into those four cells. And that was how I got through this New York Times hard Sudoku. I'd be interested to know if especially if you used a different technique, whether you still came across this quadruple or whether you had some other form of breaking through in this puzzle. But otherwise, thank you very much for watching and uh, hope to see you again soon on Cracking the Cryptic.